Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm uh, uh, really grateful I can speak here. And also, I, I must say, I'm a little excited because it's, it's not that often as a mathematician that I give these talks to a broad audience. So paradigm shifts in mathematics. Are there paradigms in mathematics, really? Maybe yes. And have they shifted? This I find hard to say. Mathematics, after all, is, is a very ahistorical subject. One thing that has changed dramatically, I think, in the 20th century is the way that mathematicians think about their subject at a very fundamental level. Um, I'd like to present some of this today, and then maybe we can discuss later if you think that this constitutes paradigm shift, or maybe you just wish to decide for yourself. But before I get there, let me take a step back and give something of a panoramic presentation of mathematics. What is math mathematics all about? In essence, mathematics is the art of doing the following two things well. First, you have to formulate a statement. Ideally, that the statement should be relevant. Well, today maybe it suffices if it's relevant to the funding agencies. Um, um, it should be interesting and you should hope it's true. And then the second part is to prove it. Ideally, you prove your, your, your conjecture yourself and once this is done, you call it a theorem or maybe somebody else does it for you. Um, of course, their conjectures and their great conjectures and their uh, theorems and their amazing ones. So what, what makes for a good conjecture or a theorem? This is very hard to answer and maybe easier answered in applied mathematics where uh, mathematics is great if it's relevant for the problem you're looking at. Or maybe if it tells you that the problem you wanted to solve isn't doable. Or maybe it tells you that you've been looking at the wrong problem altogether and you should instead be looking at something else. What is a great theorem? A great theorem, or, uh, sorry, what is a great proof? A great proof often has some aspect of beauty to it. It is beautiful, usually in a very minimalistic sense. Um, in that it, it takes a minimal amount of technology to do, in a surprising way, a maximal effect. Now, this is maybe a little theoretical, uh, so I'd like, to, I'd like to illustrate all this with a bit of an example um, that I fear some of you have heard already, but I trust you, you have your cell phones with you, and you can check your email if, if you know all this. So. Um, what makes for a great theorem that in many of us has struck a chord and that we find beautiful and interesting? It's often result, results that connect two branches of mathematics that initially seem entirely unrelated. And here's one, it's about 100 years old, but it's something that's, that's kind of easy to explain, so it became a bit of a standard example for me. So you take a ball or a sphere, I could say, and then you cut it into polygons. So here, uh, uh, this has been done by us. So for us, the, the polygons are, are uh, given different colors. And then you count how many polygons there are, or faces, I could call them. And then, six in this example, I think. And then you could count how many edges there are. Six in this example as well. And then you have uh, two vertices. One is, if you wish, the North Pole and the other is the South Pole. So then you build the sum. Six faces minus six edges plus two vertices makes two, and this is called the Euler characteristic. And uh, well, maybe this is not very interesting as it stands, but the, the uh, central observation, which is probably due to Euler or maybe a little bit earlier, is uh, that the number two that comes out doesn't depend on how you're how you're decomposing your sphere into polygons. There's many ways to do this. Sometimes in a lecture I have, I have balloons with me that I hand out to students. They can take their ball pens and then uh, usually they create a mess. Um, but here's another way. 
to do that, if you do this, you have uh, 32 faces, there are 12 pentagons, 20 hexagons, 90 edges, 60 vertices makes two. And uh, uh, another way to do it would be this. This is a chemical compound that has become famous a couple of decades ago. And again, you get the number two, and what Euler tells us is, uh, is that no matter how you're decomposing your sphere into polygons, if you count it that way, it's always the number two that comes out. So that maybe is already interesting, but is not connecting two things. So let me, let me come up with something entirely different. Uh, before I gave this lecture, I went to the Müller drugstore to buy a ball. It turned out a little larger than I expected. So thank you for blowing this up. Uh, so uh, if you take the sphere, here's a sphere. And then we are looking at vector fields. Vector fields is a flamboyant way of saying like wind. Uh, the wind is going around <coughs> and maybe uh, to, to look at the, the easiest setup that we could come up is that wind is always blowing westwards. So this is wind or uh, if, you, if you're so inclined you could call that a dynamical system. So you can start a balloon here and then you can see how it flows around with the wind. And if I look at this dynamical system going round, then it has two vortices, that is at the North Pole and at the South Pole. Aha, so we see the number two. And it turns out that is a result from the uh, uh, early 30s, late 20s of the last century, that this number two is not specific to that particular field of wind. If you look at any form of wind and you count the number of vertices or in the theory of, of dynamical systems, I, I would say equilibria. Turns out that the number is always two if you count them properly. That means you have to take multiplicities and you have to take orientation into account. So you can always make a, a, a vertex and then two of them cancel. So they, they shouldn't count. But if you count them properly, multiplicities and, and uh, orientation included, is a number two that comes out. And, okay, that again might be a great theorem, but what's, what's fantastic is its proof. Its proof tells us that the two numbers that we are seeing in the statement of, of Euler and the number uh, that appears in the statement of Lefschetz, who incidentally, Lefschetz was the blueprint for Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strange Love. Um, so these two numbers, they're, they're actually the same and it's not accident. This is two for any space. So given any space, here's another space, cut it into polygons, you count as you did before, and that tells you something about the number of equilibria that any dynamical system on that space has to have. So if you do it here, you could, you could cut this into squares, I think. That would be a very easy way of cutting this space. And then if you cut it into squares, or maybe you do it like beehive style, you immediately recognize that the number that comes out, the Euler characteristic is zero. And also we immediately see a dynamical system without equilibria, which is just wind going round and round and round and round. And round. Ah, so the circle maybe also has Euler characteristic zero. Because the same going round works for a circle, but not for a sphere. And this is true in very high generality and for arbitrary spaces in arbitrary dimensions and, and great complication and generality. And what's the amazing thing is that the proof that Lefschetz and his successor gave actually connects the two things. So the proof tells us that there is an amazing theory in the background nowadays called cohomology, that these two theorems are just special cases of. There is a unifying framework that combines them all. And this is what I personally think is a great theorem because it's it's a, a proof that connects two things that Im initially cutting stuff into pieces and looking at equilibrium point, what's the relation? Turns out to be cohomology. So this is something that I find beautiful. Um, and this is how I would like to, uh, to introduce today's lecture. 
So uh, I would like to talk about proof and its special, its special place in mathematics and doing a bit of research preparing this talk, I came across the following statement by Stephen Kranz, who is a well-known mathematics writer. The unique feature that sets mathematics apart from other sciences, from philosophy, and indeed all other forms of intellectual discourse is use of rigorous proof. It is a proof concept that makes the subject cohere, that gives it its timeliness and its proof that, the, that is our device for establishing the absolute and irrevocable truth of the statements in our subject. This is the reason that we can depend on mathematics that was done by Euclid 2,300 years ago as readily as we believe in the mathematics that is done today. These are great words. Um, I'm not a man of great words, so let me summarize this as uh, proof in mathematics is important. Uh, and it's constitutional for what we're doing. Um, if you have a great conjecture that no one can prove, even after a long time, conjectures can be very influential in the history of mathematics. They have often been very influential. But if after a while there is no proof, then what's the point? So, Today, I would like to talk about the notion of proof, um, its place in mathematics, and how our, our idea of proof has changed dramatically over time. Maybe I should say, side note, if I look at the history of mathematics and look what people worried about and what was disputed, then uh, history of mathematics, as probably everybody knows, has its share of characters. And not all of them amiable Fox, so there was lots to disagree. But somewhat surprisingly, what makes for a good conjecture should be interesting. What makes for a good proof, it should be like, precise. And even like the worst enemies of all times in mathematics, Newton and Leibniz, they never discussed whether somebody, something that the other party did was interesting. And in the history of mathematics, there's for me still somewhat amazingly, there's never been so much as a dissent what's interesting. But whether what you are saying constitutes a proof, that was always under debate. And that was like how Leibniz's main line of attack when he, uh, when he talked about Newton's Principia. Um, okay, but that, that was a side note. So let me, let me give a, a bit of an overview of the history of proof and how it came to be in our subject. So the origins of mathematics are uh, not entirely known. The oldest that we have some documentation of is Babylonian mathematics. Their level of achievement was amazing. Much of trigonometry was known and they were able to solve very hard problems. They felt the need to justify what they, they, they were doing. Um, there is, uh, there's clay tablets that give some sort of justification, but that sort of justification was mostly practical and I would say anecdotal. Statements were justified because they're, they're known to work, or look at this example and you'll see how it works. Whether it still works in other examples wasn't discussed much. But experience shows us that this works well and here, here's, one item where, where, here's one instance where it worked. So that sort of thing that nowadays probably we wouldn't call a proof. It was like a heuristics argument, um, some idea, but not, not very precise. So the idea of proof probably came up really later. So by 500 BC, Pythagoras highlights the need of proof and he comes up with a idea which is very, very modern as we will see. The idea that one should formulate a set of statements that are accepted as true, the axioms, and then any other statement should follow from these axioms by logical deduction. So that was his fundamental idea, which has been maybe the most influential idea in mathematics of all times. Uh, the idea was embraced by the community at the time, like a hundred years later, Eodoxus uh, wrote a long treatise on how important the proof it is. But interestingly, he never proved much himself. Uh, so he, he, he stayed with the Babylonians. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, a center point, focal point of all mathematics history is, of course, uh, uh, by the year 300 BC, Euclid 
writes his elements. The, many people say the second most influential book of all times. I don't know if that's true. It's certainly the second most printed book after the Bible. And it certainly has had a great impact. Abraham Lincoln always had a copy in his saddlebag. Uh, so did Einstein, and, uh, except that maybe Einstein was riding a car. Um, uh, uh, we, we, we don't have to speak of Thomas Jefferson, who, who obviously knew Euclid in and out. So that was hugely influential, and that book was, was fundamentally new in that uh, it has features that previously were not known. The text is organized with very explicit axioms that are stated axiom. Here's the axiom. It's not that something that's implicit in what I'm saying. No, he, he tries to state it and makes it the most precise that he can. What his axioms were is not exactly clear. So if we look at today's copies, then it says something like a point is that which has no part, which today I guess we wouldn't call an axiom. Uh, whether it was Euclid's own writing or whether it was Roman mistranslation, uh, we don't know. So uh, a copy of the original no one has seen. And what the original was like, we have only very indirect ideas of. But he does try to give explicit axioms, very explicit definitions. And then he has uh, a toolbox of logical operations that he applies on his axioms to get the statements that he's interested in. That's fundamentally new, and that was the, the blueprint for mathematics until, I would say, today. But then, of course, uh, mathematics after Euclid, uh, there were some developments, but essentially it stalled. Not so much mathematics was done during the Roman Empire and after. Some mathematics, in particular some of the Greek and Hellenistic tradition, survived in the Islamic world. In particular, in the, uh, in the 8th century, Al-Khwarizmi in Tehran developed what a subject that we nowadays call algebra. And his name, or rather the Latin pronunciation of his name, is, is nowadays well known as the word algorithm. But for our purposes, um, uh, let me just not get into, into too much detail here and stay in the West where the Greek mathematics is rediscovered like so many other things in the, in the Renaissance and where mathematics sees a, a flourishing in the late Renaissance and, and early afterwards. During that time, the masters of the time, Newton, Leibniz, Euler, Gauss, Gauss was maybe a little later, uh, they held the elements in very high esteem and they wouldn't stop to praise that book. On the other hand, they, they didn't really put their money where their mouth was. Everybody said the elements is great and we should follow this, only they didn't. Uh, they did give some form of proof, but uh, it wasn't in the here's my axiom and now logical deduction style. It was often rather informal, and as time progressed and mathematics saw a golden era in the 19th century, proofs became more and more informal. And it was widely seen that to give a proof really wasn't so gentlemanlike. If I give a proof, that, then I'm probably saying that I think you're stupid. Otherwise, if you're as smart as I am, then you wouldn't need the proof. You could come up with that yourself. So um, uh, people became less and less precise. Their writings, in part, very unclear. Of course, great mathematics was done, no doubt, uh, with great impact on society and everything else. But uh, uh, by the late 19th century, we are seeing a crisis, in particular in my field, geometry. Uh, there was a very, very notable school in Italy at the time. They did amazing things, forerunners of what we are doing today. And precision wasn't what they were interested in. They were interested in bright ideas. They gave them, they wrote them down. And as a result, by the late 19th, early 20th century, more and more young people moved out of the subject because it wasn't 
Nobody could tell anymore what, what, what's correct and what isn't. There's these books written by great Italian masters. There's a theorem there, and is that theorem true as stated? Or often it was true under some assumptions that the master had in his mind as he wrote this. And uh, maybe the argumentation that he had on his, in his mind was based on other stuff that was, that was known to be wrong or turned afterwards out to be wrong. So uh, there was a great uncertainty there and people no longer knew what's true and what isn't. And as a result, if you're a brilliant young mind wishing to start an intellectual endeavor, you shy away from the subject and move somewhere else. So uh, that has put mathematics into a crisis and there are similar developments seen. Uh, seen in other fields. Did I say mathematics? Geometry. Uh, similar developments in other fields. So um, the uh, whole business, I would say, was, was in a decline. And people started to question more broadly, what are our foundations? How should we look at this? And as part of this endeavor, the International Mathematical Union asked David Hilbert, who was known as the last mathematician in the world who had a broad, complete view of the whole subject, for the 1900 anniversary to give a talk where Hilbert was supposed to present a list of problems that he thinks mathematics should be looking at. And one of the most famous problems asks for a clarification of the foundation of arithmetics and what he really had in mind was of all mathematics. Um, that was highly influential and by the 1920s Hilbert formulated his famous Hilbert program that I summarize with these two items here. I'm a little worried that the summary, the, this summary looks ridiculous. Uh, because obviously Hilbert was a very deep mind, you can say that, and there was so much more behind this that I'm skipping here. So what he had in mind was, we have seen that mathematics out the foundation was rotten. There was a huge agreement that mathematics was in a foundational crisis and something needed to be done. And when people started to think about it, it, was, it became clear to them that they don't even understand the first word, the word set. What do we mean by set? There is what later became known as the Russell antonomy that tells us that everybody has been using the word set for millennia and we don't know what it is. Um, so what, what, what Hilbert really then tried to establish, or well, he laid us this program, was uh, make mathematics really precise. Formulate your language up to the point. Language is a string of symbols one after another. Formulate your axioms in your language very precisely. And then, if you choose your systems of axiom right, then he was dreaming, that was his plan, that um, uh, you have a bunch of logic steps. So this is, today we would say in computer lingo, an operation operating on strings, strings being the mathematical theorems like axioms. And whenever you have a statement that's a well-deformed statement of your formal language, then you should either be able to give a proof of that statement by using logic steps to reducing it to the axioms, or you prove that it's false by, you, you prove the opposite, that the converse is true. So that was the idea. Find a system of axioms that's so big that you can decide the truth or falsehood of any given statement that makes sense in your formal language. And of course you want your axiom, uh, system of axioms to be sufficiently small so that there is no, um, no redundancy there. Right. And your system of axioms and your language should be powerful enough so you can at least formulate number theory in it. So that was Hilbert's dream and Hilbert's program, which was immensely influential. It's probably fair to say that almost all of computer science came out of this. And it turns out by 1931 that none of this works. That is a famous result of Kurt Goethe. So pretty much everything that Hilbert had in mind won't work. There is no way 
You can use your language to prove that your system of axiom is consistent. And no matter how big your axiom system is, there's always statements in number theory that are true, yet you can't prove them. Okay, you might say, okay, then I add this statement as an axiom. Okay, then there will be other statements that you can't prove. So, in a sense, uh, Hilbert's program was a complete disaster. None of this worked, but at least you can say that people learn a lot. Um, uh, that is a very minimum. And uh, of course, I mean, it was, it, was, it was greatly successful and it laid the foundation of what we call mathematics today. Um, so what is the situation nowadays? Nowadays, mathematicians, not having any other option, have learned to live with the limitations found by Goethe. So we know that there are statements that we can't prove, although they are true even maybe very elementary ones. Um, we have, the community has by and large agreed on a system of axioms. It's uh, called, among friends, the uh, zermelo frankel and axiom with, of choice. Zermelo, by the way, was a colleague from Freiburg who had to escape Germany after he was denounced by his Freiburg colleagues for not starting his lectures with a Hitler greeting. He came back after the war but he was in ill health and unable to work as a professor anymore. You'll find his name in the entrance hall uh, on the other side of the building. Um, and the uh, proofs have become much more precise than before. So uh, that crisis that we have seen by the end of the 19th century is essentially over. But to be honest, we also don't put our money where our, our mouths are. When we teach mathematics, what we should be teaching by the Euclidean ideal is here's the axioms, here's the list of logical operations that you can apply to the axioms, and now we go and do that. Some people started to do mathematics that way. There is the notorious work of Bert Russell, but it's, it's just not human. It's, uh, if, if you look at his book, and he's proving elementary statements here, like 13 is a prime number, it's pages and pages filled with symbols that, that are then manipulated in some ways. There's no way for, for a reader like me to have any clue what's going on. So I need to translate this into my language, into my head, and then, okay, I, I might be able to say, okay, that is a correct proof. But there's, this is no way that I can do mathematics or infect most other people. So it turns out that uh, uh, we think Zermelo, Frankel, and Axiom with a choice is a way to go, only we don't do it, <clears throat> and we don't even teach it to our students. If I ask the colleagues, uh, do you know what the axioms are precisely? It turns out that most of us won't know, and I'm certainly one of them. Um, also, the way we teach in classroom is not that we teach them the axioms. They learn by way of example what makes for an acceptable argumentation, what is considered a proof in the community and what isn't, which is, has worked well for generations and generations, but really isn't the way that we think we should be doing mathematics. And uh, that, I think, might change in the future. We have computer systems now that are able to reduce our proofs to the conjectures and to the logical operations. When I said that the mathematics written down by Bert Russell wasn't human, this is what I had in mind. It should be done by computers. And actually, the uh, 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 computers, to a large extent, were invented precisely for that purpose. When people thought about mechanical computation engines, that, that was what they had in mind. And computers nowadays are so powerful that in principle we can do this. The uh, computer systems exist. They're at present cumbersome to use, so not widely adopted by the community, but there are some very notable proofs that have been fully formalized with these systems and fully reduced to the axioms, like the Kepler conjecture on the densest packing of spheres in space is maybe the most prominent example. And there is hope that as computers become more and more powerful, they will start speaking our language. And maybe eventually read my mind or something. But, um, uh, so 
very notable colleagues, some of them with Fields medals, are working on the foundation of mathematics again, and they are thinking how this axiom and logic deduction system could be formulated in a way that is more amenable for a computer human interface. Uh, whether this will be met with a success, I guess only history can tell. Uh, I'm mildly positive um, because these systems already work. So if you have like a standard textbook knowledge that everyone should understand really well, like beginner's course in, in, in mathematics. So if you're really practiced with these computer systems, the experts say that it takes about two days per one page of text to, to, to put it into these uh, systems and really to reduce it to the axioms now. That will certainly improve. Also, there is some uh, commercial interest there, which means that uh, other people than, than mere pure mathematicians have an interest in developing these systems. Uh, that will have huge commercial effects. Will computers ever be able to replace mathematicians by finding themselves conjectures that we would agree are interesting? The answer, I don't know. I'm, well, in the long run, maybe. But I don't see this as really immediate. And uh, uh, I think the uh, machine verifiable proofs this is, this is the next step and then what comes after, I'm not so sure. So thank you so much for your time. <laughs>